The reading today is taken from Colossians 1, 21 to 23. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation, under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Good morning, Church at Home. Uh, good to be with you. Won't you join me in a word of prayer before we come to our passage? Let's pray together. Father, we ask that this morning by your Spirit, you will show us once again that Jesus is enough, that he is the fullness of deity in bodily form, that he is the cosmic Christ of a creation and new creation, that he's enough for the universe, he's enough for the local church, he's enough for us. We pray these things in his precious name. Amen. Last week, we were confronted by the Christ in all his cosmic grandeur. We were confronted by the Son, by the King of creation and new creation. It was a vision so grand and majestic that we could hardly take it in. You remember those verses. This week, we see all that cosmic power, all that infinite love, focused in and concentrated on a small community in a medium-sized town, in a Roman province of very average importance. A town which uh, the Apostle Paul had never even visited, the town of Colossae. J.B. Lightfoot called the church in Colossae the least important church to which Paul ever wrote. But this is the nature of our God, and this is the nature of his gospel, the glory of his gospel, the God who flings stars into space also knows the number of hairs on your head. The infinite cosmic power of the Christ in creation and new creation is for the church at Colossae, that backwater of a church. And it's for us in Midrand. And it's for you. That's the message of our passage. The grandeur and glory of God working itself out in the humility of the local church. And they needed to hear it, the church at Colossae. They needed to hear it because they, were, they, like us, were tempted in every direction to supplement the gospel with worldly props. Paul's point in presenting Jesus in his true scale and beauty is that you can't add anything to infinity. You can't supplement perfection. Paul says to the Colossians, you can't make any difference to Christ. But he has made every difference to you. So keep trusting in him and in him alone. That's the headline. If you want to take anything away, take that. The way Paul makes his case is by reminding the Colossians what you once were, what you are now, and what you will be. So it's past, present, and future. What you once were, what you are now, what you will be. Let's go on that journey with our brothers and sisters from Colossae. What you once were, verse 21. Read it with me. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. And you. There it is. It's what we sometimes call the scandal of particularity. The universal truth of God in Christ applied to the church in Colossae. For no apparent reason other than God's love. And you. And you. Don't skip past those words. They are an extraordinary testimony to God's grace. And you. Especially when we consider the words that follow. Verse 21 again. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. That was you. Do you remember a time like that? Some of us were spared that experience by the grace of God. We grew up knowing the Lord. There's never a time we can remember when the Lord Jesus 
wasn't our saviour and our king and our friend. But others remember a time like that. Remember a time like verse 21. I do. I was a nasty piece of work. It's not going to come as a surprise to anyone on staff. I look at the words hostile, alienated, doing evil deeds, and they are a photograph of me at one time. For many of you, it's the same. You can remember a time when any talk of God, any mention of God, even the thought of God would make you angry and hostile. And if you stop to think about it, you can't really work out if you were hostile and angry because your deeds were evil and you knew that God wouldn't approve of that lifestyle or if your deeds were evil because you were hostile and alienated in your mind. Alienated mind because of evil deeds or evil deeds because of alienated mind. Which comes first? One commentator puts it so well. He says, thought and act are both tainted each pushing the other into further corruption. Wrong thinking leads to vice, vice to further mental corruption, so that the mind, still not totally ignorant of God's standards, finds itself applauding evil. We not only do evil, we approve of those who do. Verse 21 is a picture of the pagan life without God. When we read that description, alienated, hostile, doing evil, Our minds might be tempted to turn to an actual earthly example, um, some sort of monster in the public domain, someone like Jeffrey Epstein. Now, his story is tricky. It's hard to get to the bottom of his story because so much of his story has been buried by expensive lawyers who were implicated in the story. But it appears, the overwhelming evidence suggests Of course, the whole thing was never really resolved. He died before he stood trial. He committed suicide, or that's all up for debate. But it certainly appears that over the years, he faced several charges, dozens of charges, laid against him for sexual offenses relating to young, underage girls, charges including sex trafficking. Now, just so we remind ourselves of the gravity of those words because we can become numb to these things. Sexual trafficking means taking a young girl, some of these girls were as young as 12 years old, and selling her, leasing her out, so to speak, as a sex slave. You may have heard of Lolita. Lolita is the title of an infamous novel written about the sexual abuse of a 12-year-old girl by her stepfather. Jeffrey Epstein had a private Boeing 727 that would fly him and his friends, many of them high-profile friends, to his private island called Little St. James in the Virgin Islands. He called it Little St. Jeff's. The locals on that island had a nickname for the plane. They called it the Lolita Express. That gives us some insight into what the plane and the island were for. We might read verse 21, alienated, hostile, doing evil. We might read those words, we might read that verse and think Jeffrey Epstein. But that's not quite right, is it? What money and power do is they take the reins off of sin. They take away all constraints. The corrupt mind and the evil deeds can run free. There are no limits. But that corrupt mind, those evil deeds, the sin that produces that sort of fruit is already in every heart. Money and power just take the reins off. What celebrity does is it takes that sin, the sin that is in every heart, and broadcasts it onto the big screen or onto Netflix. But again, it's the sin that is in every heart. We mustn't make the mistake of reading verse 21 and think it's reserved for the likes of Jeffrey Epstein. Before Harry Potter made her famous, J.K. Rowling wrote a little story called The Ichabog. She's actually been publishing it one chapter a day over the course of of lockdown, it's, it's a brilliant allegory of, of state capture 
uh, to my mind. Um, I'm just going to read one passage. It gives us some insight into the hostile mind and the way the hostile alienated mind functions. So I'll read for you. Quite a long passage, but, but it's colorful. It's J.K. Rowling. What happened was this. The king of Pluritania came to pay a formal visit to King Fred. And Fred decided that he must have a brand new set of cl clothes made for the occasion. Dull purple overlaid with silver lace, amethyst buttons, and gray fur at the cuffs. Now, King Fred had heard something about the head seamstress not being quite well, but he hadn't really paid any attention. He didn't trust anyone but Daisy's mother to stitch on the silver lace properly, so he gave the order that nobody else should be given the job. In consequence, Daisy's mother sat up three nights in a row, racing to finish the purple suit in time for the King of Pluritania's visit. And at dawn on the fourth day, her assistant found her lying dead on the floor with the very last amethyst button in her hand. While his dressers were helping him into the new purple suit later that morning, Fred tried to make himself feel a little less guilty by talking the matter over with Lords Spittleworth and Flapoon. I mean to say, if I'd, if I'd known she was seriously ill, panted Fred, as the servants heaved him into his skin-tight satin pantaloons, naturally I'd have let someone else sew the suit. Your majesty is so kind, said Spittleworth. A more tender-hearted monarch was never born. The woman should have spoken up if she was unwell, grunted Flapoon from a cushioned seat by the window. If she's not fit to work, she should have said so. Properly looked at, that's disloyalty to the king. Or to your suit, anyway. Flapoon's right, said Spittleworth, turning away from the mirror. No one could treat his servants better than you do, sire. I do treat them well, don't I? said King Fred, anxiously sucking in his stomach as his dresses did up his amethyst buttons. Put this unhappy occurrence out of your mind, sire, said Flapoon. A disloyal seamstress is no reason to spoil a sunny day. Isn't it beautiful? King Fred wasn't a sex trafficker. His deed was simply failing to love another human being, failing to acknowledge her struggle. But when he reasons with his lords and he concludes that his own sin was in fact hers, we can see clearly. He shares the same corruption of mind as Jeffrey Epstein, the same alienation, the same hostility. It's not the same in quantity or extent it's the same in quality, nature. The seeds are there, even if the plant is not fully grown. We mustn't make the mistake of thinking that because our sins are more socially acceptable than, say, sex trafficking, more respectable in pleasant company, that verse 21 doesn't apply to us. Remember the writer to the Hebrews, you'll remember from our series, the writer to the Hebrews wrote that unbelief itself is evil. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, says that anything which does not come from faith is sin. If ever there was a time when you were alienated from God, where you were not his loving, obedient son or daughter, then all of verse 21 is yours, and you must own it. That's what you once were. Who of us can claim that we are better than King Fred? Who of us never ignored someone else's struggle, never failed to love someone else as ourselves. Anyone? And if we're honest, don't we have our own lords, Spittleworth and Flapoon? Don't we let them convince us that we were right all along? And in fact, my sin was the other person's fault. So I'm a, you know, on the whole, I'm a good person. And if anyone was out of line, it was her. Don't we have that kind of conversation with ourselves or with others all the time? Don't we find it exceedingly easy to condemn the sin in others, but to justify ourselves for the very, very same sin? That comes naturally. That's easy. We have to own all of that. We have to remember how bad it was, how bad it sometimes still is, if we're going to have any grasp of how good God is. We have to own verse 21 if we're going to have any hope 
of coming to terms with the magnitude of verse 22. We have to plumb the depths of who we were if we are ever going to begin to fathom the heights of who God is. That's what you once were, verse 21. What you are now, verse 22. I'll pick it up in verse 21 just to help us with the flow. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. The first thing that really should strike us, but often doesn't, is who's done the reconciling. You were alienated. You were hostile. You were evil. But he has reconciled. That's back to front, isn't it? Surely the offending party does the reconciling. Surely the offending party takes the initiative. No. No. This is the extraordinary back-to-front grammar of grace. God blesses us beyond our wildest dreams. We reject him. We are hostile towards him. We are alienated from him by our own choosing. We do the things we know will cause him pain. And so the relationship is broken. Surely, given all of that, we need to fix it. I mean, yes, that would be right and fair. But that's not what happens. He comes to us, those who have declared war on him. He comes to us with nothing but the offer of more kindness, blessing upon blessing, nothing but forgiveness and love. But surely we have to do something to make it right. I mean, I've had conversations with some of you, and, 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 and I feel your exasperation at this point. I've, I've heard some of you grappling with grace. Surely I have to do something. No, that's the grammar of penance. And penance makes so much sense to us. Penance is pay as you go. But it's not the grammar of grace. We said two words in verse 21 were a scandal. And you. It only takes one word in verse 22. He. He does the reconciling. How easy is it to reconcile? And let's take our own experience here in South Africa. We've had our commission. How easy has it been? How's it gone since then? What is the state of reconciliation right now? How do you reconcile two parties on opposite sides of 400 years of oppression? Let's widen the scope. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Right to the beginning. How do you reconcile Cain to Abel when Abel is nothing more than a beaten, bloodied corpse? How do you reconcile Cain to his mother, Abel's mother? How do you reconcile Abram to his wife when he effectively gave her to another man just to save his own skin? So you are the marriage counselor. What do you say? How do you reconcile Lot to his daughters who got him drunk so that he would impregnate them? How do you reconcile David to Bathsheba? He took her for sex and then orchestrated the murder of her husband. How do you reconcile Assyria to the peoples they colonized and oppressed for economic and political gain? We could ask the same thing of Babylon or Persia, or Greece, or Rome. Alexander the Great had a stated goal. His goal in life was to civilize every continent. And by civilize, he meant Hellenize. He wanted to make the world Greek. How do we reconcile him to the cities he burned and the cultures he destroyed in the process, in the name of his goal? We see the same Imperial instinct in Attila the Hun, King Shaka, Genghis Khan, Napoleon Bonaparte, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Idi Amin, Cecil John Rhodes. It's estimated that Stalin killed between 20 and 100 million of his own people. 20 million is the official number. 
that came out of the Soviet republics. So we can imagine that 100 million is probably a lot closer to the actual number. Forced removals of whole peasant communities were the norm. That was not unusual. You could be sent to a labor camp in Siberia simply for writing a subversive poem, and many were. I mean, if that was you, if you were sent to the gulags, to the salt mines, for a piece of satirical art, how could you, I mean, imagine it, wrenched from your family, wrenched from everyone you know and love, wrenched from your livelihood, taken to work on the salt mines for decades. How could you ever possibly be reconciled to Joseph Stalin? What amount of social justice penance can ever make up for apartheid? The problem is aggravated. It's actually aggravated when we bring it back down to the individual level, to our ordinary lives. Just think about a complicated, difficult relationship that you have with someone who's close to you. Long-standing relationship. Might be a close friend, an old friend, might be your spouse, some member of your extended family. Think about that relationship and all its awkwardness. And be honest with yourself. Who's the victim and who's the perpetrator? It's not so black and white, is it? How does reconciliation work when those lines are blurred? If reconciliation means putting the relationship back on an even footing and restoring trust, that is going to require, I think we, it's, it's easy for us to see, it's going to require some justice and some mercy. But how much? And in which direction? Let's take it back up to the corporate scale. When we're talking about the sins of our fathers, past generations, and the offense spans decades and involves millions of people, or back down to the individual. If the offense is just a single murdered brother, how is reconciliation possible if it requires that much justice and that much mercy? How is it possible when it isn't always clear where to aim the justice and the mercy? When all human beings need both. What could possibly ever achieve true reconciliation? What does it take? It takes the death of God. Nothing less. Every single offense, whether it's shouting at your wife or the killing fields in Cambodia, every single offense is an offense against the God of holy love. And that means the problem of reconciliation is as deep as every last little wrong ever committed. And as dark as committing every last little wrong against God himself. God alone can bear the weight of all that sin. God alone can offer a penance worthy of all that pain. God alone is good enough in life and death to put all things right and make reconciliation. Verse 22, And you who were once alienated, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Those who were alienated, hostile, evil perpetrators, God has now reconciled to himself by the suffering and death of his son. Reconciliation with God, because of its enormous dimensions, opens the way for us to be reconciled to one another. No matter how great the sin, the cross is more. No matter how great the sin, the penance Christ offered is greater. No matter how deep the injustice, the righteousness of Christ is higher. On the cross, there is full justice for the victim. And there is full mercy for the perpetrator. And since all of us are both victim and perpetrator in different parts of the day, that is good news for everyone. We were once alienated, 
what we are now is reconciled to God and equipped with every resource for full reconciliation with one another in the cross. What you once were, alienated. What you are now, reconciled. What will you be? So that's past and present. What does the future hold? Verse 22 again. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Blameless and above reproach are judgment words. Christ does his work of reconciliation so that we can stand in the final judgment. Holiness has the same connotation, but it goes further. To be holy is to be purified of sin, but it's also to be set apart for God. And if we are found to be set apart for God on that final day, if that is the judgment because Christ has dealt with all of our hostility and alienation and evil, and he has brought us near, What are we set apart for? We are set apart for eternal life with God. And the wonderful news, the news of unimaginable wonder, is that eternity starts now. We begin to become who we are in Christ today. We hear the word holy. It's a Bible word. It's a church word. It's a boring word. To us, it means the end of fun. We switch off. But when you hear the word holy and you hear it applied to you, set apart for God, you should explode with joy. I don't think we begin to fathom what it means that we are holy, set apart for God. I'm going to let Jonathan Edwards explain it, describe it at least. It's a mystery that can't really be neglected be explained but but here's his description he writes this holiness is a most beautiful and lovely thing we drink in strange notions of holiness from our childhood as if it were a melancholy morose sour and unpleasant thing but there is nothing in it other than what is sweet and ravishingly lovely it is the highest beauty vastly above all other beauties holiness is of a sweet pleasant charming, lovely, amiable, delightful, serene, calm, and still nature. It is almost too high a beauty for any creatures to be adorned with. It makes the soul a little sweet and delightful image of the blessed Jehovah. Oh, of what a sweet, humble nature is holiness. How peaceful and loving of all things but sin. Of how refined and exalted a nature it is. How it changes the soul and makes it more excellent than other beings. How is it possible that such a divine thing should be on earth? He goes on and on. On the last day, you will be counted holy. And everything I've just read will be yours in its fullness. And that change, the journey to that last day, begins now. Today, we begin to become who we are, who we already are in Christ Jesus. You were once hostile to God, alienated in your mind, but now he has reconciled you to himself so that one day you will stand in the judgment and be holy, set apart for God, not just in status, but in the beauty, the beauty of your character for eternity. That's what you once were, what you are now, and what you will be if. If, another big little word. Verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. You can count yourself reconciled, ready for judgment and the holiness of eternity if you continue to trust in Christ. Now, why does Paul add the if? He adds it because like us, the Colossians were tempted on every side by a whole range of alternatives to trusting in Christ. 
It's a bit like going shopping, right? You go in needing one important item. Let's call it um, a pack of AAA batteries. So you are focused, especially the gents. You're focused, you're task-driven, you avert your eyes, you're not making eye contact, you're not interested in any other aisle, but aisle four where the AAA batteries can be found. You go, you grab your batteries, you turn for the checkout, you enter the queue, and of course the queue has been arranged like a theme park. It winds its way, it meanders its way endlessly through the never, never land of impulse purchases. All those chocolates calling out to you. Pick me, pick me. You need me. And by the time you walk out, the one essential item has become a whole basket full of nice to haves, little treats, patkos. That's the domesticated version of a very dangerous spiritual reality. There's a whole range of spiritual supplements calling for a spot next to Jesus. But in middle class Midrand, the ones that shout the loudest, loudest generally have to do with lifestyle aspirations. I love Jesus, but I don't need to be fanatical and invest all my hope in him. There has to be a little bit of room for house, car, career, education, that whole package. He takes care of the spiritual side, but the portfolio is not quite complete without a few lifestyle investments. My picture of salvation has a certain address, a certain horsepower. It wears a certain school tie. In other words, Jesus is wonderful, but we go too far if we say that he's everything. I mean, everything. Surely not. Jesus is wonderful, but on his own, he's not quite enough. The whole force of the letter to the Colossians is that he is. And what a force it is. Let me just read those verses from last week again. I'll just read them. Let them wash over you. Drink them in. From verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. All things, all things, all things, fullness. My friends, what can you add to infinity? What supplement is there worthy of perfection? Jesus is the cosmic Christ. He is the king of creation and new creation. And he's our king. He's king of the local church. He's your king and my king. Any whisper in your ear that there is more available over here or over there or just around the corner is a lie from the pits of hell. Put your trust in him and in him alone. Let's pray. Father, we have so much competing for our trust. Please, by your spirit, through your word, by the gift of each other, remind us, remind us daily, Lord, of what we once were, of what we are now, and of what we will one day be. Remind us that all this is ours in Christ and only in Christ. Help us, Father, to keep our trust in him, and in him alone. Help us to finish the race and keep the faith. Amen. Amen. So good to be with you. Have a wonderful week.